Today's episode is brought to you by Canby Foursquare Church. Since 1978, a place to grow, connect, and serve. In-person services are back with some restrictions to help ensure everyone stays safe and healthy. For the latest, visit their website at canbyfoursquare.com. Welcome to Now Hear This Can Be, your source for news. The threat of a possible teacher strike was avoided this week. There's a new irresistibly cute creature winning over fans, and its name is Scootaloo. Sports? It's like Lucy in the football. You want to kick a field goal, but they take it away from you. We had to learn how to win. Mm -hmm. Goal can't be in the last second of the game! And interesting conversations. Because I'm one of the strongest girls ever, and I know that for a fact. I just really enjoy writing gossip as if I was a bear. <laughs> With an old maid daughter that make the best moonshine in the coast. <laughs> and if you would hit me in the face, I think I would have died. I really do. It, it, it... I guarantee you would have died, man. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Welcome to the Now Hear This Can Be Podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Martina Baker, and this is what's happening this week in our community. The Canby City Council convened in a special session on Wednesday to consider seven candidates to replace David Bajoran, who stepped down earlier this month, citing family and professional responsibilities. Bajoran had replaced Jordan Tibals, who was elected to the seat in November 2020, but also served less than a year before resigning and moving to Texas. Seven applicants filed for the position before the April 20th deadline and were considered during a special meeting on Wednesday, April 27th. They were, in order of when they filed their paperwork, Arthur Marine, Brad D. Clark, Stephanie Boyce, Curtis M. Vikey, Jason Padden, Scott Sassy, and Hector Pepe Maldonado. Marine is a longtime mortgage banker and branch manager in Beaverton and ran unsuccessfully for a seat on the Canby School Board in 2019. He wrote that he is particularly interested in managing residential and commercial growth and the optimal allocation of resources for the city and its advisory boards. Clark, who previously sought the council appointment last year that was ultimately won by Bajoran, is a program librarian for the city of Wilsonville, as well as a crisis counseling volunteer and a pastor and a faith leader. He cited interest in strategic planning and development across city departments and supporting city employees to focus on improving quality of life for residents. If appointed, he promised to help position Canby as a forerunner of small town government. Can be first, can be better, he wrote. Boyce is the owner of the Vitamin Plaza in downtown Canby and an unsuccessful candidate for Canby City Council in 2010. She previously served on the city's budget and transportation committees and has volunteered with student activities at the high school and homeless programming at Zoar Lutheran Church. Last year, she was the lead petitioner in a failed campaign to recall Councilors Sarah Spoon and Chris Bangs, both of whom remain on the council. In her application, Boyce cited concerns with the influx of new development and whether the city's infrastructure can keep pace. Vikey is a Les Schwab Tire Center employee and military veteran who enjoys running and cycling. He said he wishes to invest in local youth. I believe in investing in the community you want to live in, and this is the best way for me to do this, he wrote. Padden is the current chair of the Canby Planning Commission and a former city councilor who stepped down due to work commitments he held at that time. He has since sought re-election or appointment to the council multiple times, including last year. He has a long history of other service to the community, including on the Budget Committee, Canby Urban Renewal Advisory Board, and Street Maintenance Task Force. His professional background is in horticultural sales and treatments, and he currently works as an area sales manager for a company that markets microbial-based bio-rational solutions to improve root growth and plant hardiness in agriculture, horticulture, landscaping, and forestry applications. Sassy is a self-employed landscaper and longtime member of the Canby Parks and Recreation Advisory Board. He cited interests in parks, downtown growth, stability, and a desire to become more involved in guiding the city's growth. Finally, Maldonado is a maintenance technician with Northwest Venture Group who cited interests in intercultural integration and development and funding for programs, projects, and events.
Oregon senior U.S. Senator Ron Wyden tested positive for COVID on Tuesday. On Twitter and in a news release, he said the infection was caught during routine testing. He's experiencing minor symptoms and is working from his residence in Washington, D.C., the statement said. He will quarantine according to Centers for Disease Control and Prevention guidelines. It recommends that people isolate themselves for five days. A spokesman, Hank Stern, says Wyden is fully vaccinated and has received two booster shots. Wyden is 72. Wyden's infection coincides with a wave of infections caused by a new variant, BA2, which appears to be the most infectious to date. The variant has become the dominant strain in Oregon, according to Oregon Health Authority data. COVID infections have risen in Oregon over the past two weeks, with a seven-day daily average of about 760 known cases. The state can only track reported tests. Many people test at home and don't report the results. Hospitalizations in Oregon remain low. 135 people are currently hospitalized with COVID. State data show that 84% of adults in Oregon have received at least one dose of a vaccine and 45% have received at least one booster dose. A second booster is approved for those aged 50 and over four months after they received their first booster shot. Oregonians who lost their homes in the 2020 Labor Day fires will get the chance to weigh in on the state's plan for a $422 million in federal recovery money. The rebuilding effort, called ReOregon, is led by the Oregon Housing and Community Services Department. The money comes from the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. The state agency's draft plan will be published on the agency's site May 2nd, and the public will have until June 1st to call and email with their thoughts or show up at one of the four community meetings that will be held in Lincoln City, Gates, Vita, and Talent from May 16th through the 19th. The cities were chosen because they were among the most impacted from the fires. The 2020 Labor Day fires, the Archie Creek, Beachy Creek, Holiday Farm, Lion's Head, and Riverside mega fires, and 12 other fires that were less than 100,000 acres, collectively burned more than a million acres and more than 4,000 homes west of the Cascades, according to the Northwest Interagency Coordination Center. The state plans to spend the bulk of the $422 million on building housing, both owned and rented, primarily for low and moderate income residents. At least 80% of the money must be spent in areas that HUD has identified as the most impacted, which include Clackamas, Douglas, Jackson, Lane, Lincoln, Lynn, and Marion counties. Other requirements are to spend at least 15% of the money on fire prevention, mitigation, and resiliency projects. Money is also being proposed to help pay for rent, counseling, and legal services and for grants to small businesses in those areas. The final plan will be approved by HUD in September, and the money will be available in the form of grants for the next six years. Democrats in Yamhill and Polk counties ended a candidate forum on Saturday after attendees began spamming the virtual meeting with graphic sexual images and racial slurs. County parties hosted a Zoom forum Saturday night with State Rep Courtney Neron, Democrat of Wilsonville, and Newburgh City Councilor Elise Yarnell Holloman. Neron is running unopposed in the primary for the 26th House District, and Yarnell Holloman and Chris Wright, chair of the Newburgh Planning Commission, are vying for the chance to take on Representative Anna Scharf, Republican Amity, in the adjacent 23rd House District. A press release sent by the chairs of the two county Democratic parties said people in the meeting used false names, racial slurs, and alignment with marginalized communities to further their bad faith actions. In a statement, Bond said she didn't know who was responsible, but understood the intent was to weaponize supposed alignment with marginalized communities for malicious purposes. 
In their own joint statement, Neron and Yarnell Holloman said the event was Zoom bombed by people using explicit language and imagery and weaponizing identities of marginalized community members under false names. Incidents of Zoom bombing were prevalent early in the pandemic when schools, government bodies, and organizations quickly pivoted to video-based communication without using security features like requiring passwords or manually approving attendees. Internet trolls would find unsecure video meetings and take over, often showing lewd images or saying racist, obscene, or otherwise offensive things. New security features and greater familiarity with video conference tools have made this much less common, though it still occurs. A meeting of the State Advisory Committee on Historic Preservation was canceled last fall after someone began posting racist and homophobic slurs and committee members' home addresses in the meeting's chat. Cougar Country Hometown Sports Coverage is brought to you by Rife and Hunsaker PC. When you need an attorney, turn to the firm Camby has trusted for over 50 years. Call them today at 503-266-3456. For the latest sports news, follow us on Twitter at Cougar Country OR and Instagram at Cougar Country POD. To say the Camby Cougars softball team is playing well would be an understatement. The scorching hot Cougars extended their win streak to double digits with three more victories this week and have not lost in over a month since dropping a 10-13 decision to number 6 McMinnville on March 21st. Last week, the Cougs picked up two closer league wins against Lake Ridge and Lake Oswego, as well as taking down Southridge. The Cougars began their week by shooting out of the gates quickly with their opening game against the Pacers. The Cougs quickly loaded the bases and recorded two runs, thanks to an Ella Keel RBI, before Lake Ridge could muster an out. Just like that, Canby led 2-0. to zero. Canby would continue to rack up the hits, but the Pacers still hung around. While the Cougars scored one additional run on an Ava Carroll bomb, the Pacers' two runs made the ball game a one-score affair in the bottom of the seventh. Despite the stakes being a bit higher than usual, pitcher Abigail Loomis made sure her team was never in serious danger of losing. After a single Cougar senior struck out three straight batters to win the game for Camby. Loomis would not need any heroics in her next outing against Southridge, though the 12 strikeouts she dealt the Skyhawks probably did little to hurt her confidence on offense. Southridge managed only one run as Canby added yet another to the W column. Brooke Heron played one of her best games of the season, scoring two runs off of her two hits on the day. Despite not recording a hit, junior Bree Marino had two RBIs on the day. Kaylee Allen also totaled two RBIs as well. The Cougars quickly transitioned back into league play two days later to face another team on a hot streak. Following a 2-4 start, Lake Oswego had won 8 of 9. After Kegel gave Canby a 1-0 lead with an RBI single in the first, the Lakers quickly struck back with a run scored on an error by Chloe Carnegie. The game remained tied for an inning before the Cougars came alive in the third, scoring two runs, once again thanks to Keel, to take a 3-1 lead. Though the Lakers managed to close the gap to 3-2, Loomis once again shut down Hope quickly in the final inning. The senior, who tossed 12 strikeouts on the day, threw two in the seventh to give the Cougars a 3-2 win and extend their win streak to double digits at 10. Hey Tyler, read any good books lately? <laughs> yeah, actually I'm reading a really good one right now. Awesome, what's it about? It's kind of complicated, but uh, there's like these two kids with an absent parent, and then this mysterious stranger shows up with his sinister accomplices, and, and they just start wreaking havoc in their lives. I think it's like a Faustian metaphor. Wow, that sounds really dense. <laughs> it is. Interesting, though. Who wrote it? You know, I, I think it's like a doctor. Starts with like an S or something. Sass, sauce. So Tyler, are you reading The Cat in the Hat? Uh... Yeah, I mean, I'm trying to. <laughs> it's taken me like two months to get this far. Okay, well, um, hey, whatever your interest or um, reading level, 
Open the World of All Things Books at the Book Nook in downtown Canby. Yeah, guys, this local independently owned and operated store is your one-stop shop for the latest releases and great deals on a huge variety of previously owned books, as well as games, art, and writing supplies and gifts. They also do book clubs and game nights if you're looking for some fun, healthy activities right here in Canby. And hey, you know, for you, Tyler, they have a really expensive selection of children's books. Oh, cool. <laughs> anyway, check them out on Facebook and Instagram, online at booknookcanby.com, or stop by 294 Northwest 2nd Avenue and let their friendly staff introduce you to your new favorite read. Hey, uh, Frankie, wh- why do you think I'd be interested in children's books? We'll talk about it later. Oh, okay. This is Roz Mason, and I'm running for State Senate District 26, which now includes Canby. I know we need affordable housing, a strong local economy, and to face climate challenges of wildfire and heat waves like last year's that hit 118 in the Dalles, where I live. Climate courage also includes upsides, like becoming more energy independent using renewables and helping our district get in on innovative technology and manufacturing jobs. I'm visiting Canby and Sandy April 14th through 16th. I'd love to see you. Visit masonfororegon.com for info and to get a yard sign. Paid for by Mason for Oregon. So my guest today is Rick Carpenter. He's a Canby resident and and a friend of mine. Rick, how are you? I'm doing fine, thank you. Rick, thanks so much for being on the show. I'm really excited. You have a, a really cool story to tell uh, that you're going to tell me and the, the listeners here. But first, I wanted to start. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe your work or anything you'd like to share, kind of flesh yourself out a little bit to folks who may not know you? Sure. Uh, in the beginning, I was a jack of all trades. I did everything from roofing to plumbing to irrigation work until finally my body quit on me. Yeah. And I decided, okay, it's time to go to college. Right. You're retired now. I I'm retired. I am retired now, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I went to college uh, at Chemeketa in Salem and got a degree in health service management. Uh, did cool. my practicum at the uh, Portland VA Medical Center in the uh, enrollment office in which the area that I was hired. Hmm. Uh, so I graduated in June and was hired in August at the VA. I worked there for 11 years and then eventually, like I say, I retired in uh, uh, April of 2017. Hmm. That puts us up to here we are today. Here we are today. Happily retired. <laughs> Enjoying it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, do you have a, a, a dog? One dog? I have a dog. It was my retirement dog. Yeah. She's a little mini Aussie. She Very keeps, cute. She I keeps met her me earlier. busy. Oh, yeah. my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, talk about therapeutic. Yeah. Uh, I have to get out and walk. Actually, I'm, I'm walked because she's a quickie. But, yeah, that's it's, she's been a savior to my to my. Uh, uh, physical abilities. Mm-hmm. And you're a military veteran. I am a former Marine. I served five. I served in uh, 72 to 74. I did not do any combat, but I am a combat uh, era veteran. Uh, I also have uh, a disability from when I served. Uh, it has taken me out, but it's also been in me for education and sorts. Mm. But uh, yeah. It's it's been a trial. I I carry the pain daily. For sure, for sure, and many do for from that era. Um, thank you for your service. Thank you. So let's get into your story a little bit. You uh, were born in Denver, Colorado. Yes. Uh, to a family with um, five brothers and sisters. You were the second, second yes. oldest, and you were uh, later uh, taken from that family and uh, wound up in the foster system. You were how old? I believe I was six or seven years old when I was removed from the home and placed into foster care, yeah. and then eventually into a home for boys where uh, my oldest brother and I came together while in that home. Uh, I must say at that time, it was the happiest day of my life up to that point, sure. seeing my oldest brother. How, how long had you been in before, your, before that moment? I believe I was there a year Oh wow! before, and, and then... Uh, 
now we have we have the Beck boys now. Yeah, to see uh, all those strange faces for so long, and then to see someone. Absolutely. Wow. Um, and basically, I guess it all happened at different times, but eventually, all of the siblings wound up in foster care, kind of separated, Absolutely. sprinkled all throughout. Absolutely. One was as young as a, a baby in a crib. At the right. Time. Uh, David was the youngest, and and Debbie, uh, I'm not certain. I'm thinking she was three or four when she was removed from the home. Or I'm not certain how that took place. I yeah. don't remember those two. Yeah. Uh, Your oldest brother, I don't remember if we mentioned his name, but he was Mike. Mike. And then the the uh, David, I think you mentioned. David. And then uh, a Jimmy. sister, Susie. Yeah, there's, and Jimmy so, was a baby. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. So you, uh, let's go back. So you were with Mike in foster care. Um, you guys kind of grew up together. Yeah, pretty much. Yeah, and as far as foster care is concerned, he and I never shared any foster parents. Mm -hmm. It was in the home for boys okay. where we came together. Gotcha. But we were adopted together gotcha. into the family that I now carry the name Carpenter with. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, he's he uh, uh, even in that time went one way and I went the other. Sure, sure, sure. So you guys grew up, went your separate ways. Um, and then there was this really incredible story of how the family sort of very slowly and through different ways uh, came back together, except for one, and we'll yes. get to her. But um, tell me about that. I think it first started kind of in 96. Yeah, 1996, my uh, adopted mother gave me a call and said, I got some news for you. Uh, two of your brothers have made a call to us, and, and they'd love to get a hold of you. It's up to you. And, and I was, was, I was oh my gosh, I was just <laughs> over the top. I couldn't believe it. Yeah. Uh, I, I immediately She's forty years yeah, after. It, yes, yeah. it's just crazy. Yeah. Uh, I I made the phone call, and I talked to Jimmy first because Jimmy's the one I remembered. He was the one that was in the crib, and I would play with him and make him laugh. Mm -hmm. And I remember that happy moment. Yeah. Uh, uh, so I called him. He called David. David lived in Oregon, and I lived in Fairfield, California. He was the closest. Yeah. So I made arrangements to come up and visit him and his family first. Yeah. So they found you. Before, before this happened, had you kind of counted them out? You're like, I'm never going to see them again? I, unfortunately for me, didn't think of it one way or another. Yeah. I just, you know, you, at a certain point in your there's life, a lot of, there's you, a lot you of are who you there. are. Yeah. You know, you know, mm -hmm. you know, there is no more. But after that happened, after they found me, uh, the thought process certainly started clicking. How do I find Susie? Mm -hmm. I don't know anything about a Debbie, but other than that she did exist. Right, you did not remember her. No. We should mention that. No. Mike, your brother, told you about her, That's but there, there might have been some trauma. You don't know why you don't yeah. remember her, uh, yeah. but you don't. Yeah. Uh, statistics show that trauma can make you remember certain things, whether it be an exciting moment or a traumatic moment. When, when you were taken, you would have been six. She would have been about four? Four, yes. Okay, but you don't remember her. Yeah. But she was already gone. Yeah, so. okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but, like I said, 96, we came together. In uh, April of 2002, I got another phone call, and it was my sister Susie's daughter. And she, it was really funny because she, she started the phone call off with, this is not a prank. I promise you. And and she started. That's asking always a prank when, it's, yeah. when a call yeah. starts like that. Yeah. So it was really fun to find out that yet yeah, we found another sibling, and this is back in the day of Nokia how, how for did, cell phones. How did they find you? I'm not certain. Yeah. Process of elimination. I, I, I don't, don't know if Ancestry.com was no, a thing in 2002. No, that wasn't. It no. wasn't. It did not exist okay. yet. Okay. Okay. But uh, the fact that whatever whatever way they found this name or that was a, a blessing because, yay, I found another sibling. And, and at that point, the five um, brothers and sisters, you guys started kind of staying in touch, getting together, absolutely. reconnecting, uh, you know, telling family histories and stories and finding some cool uh, similarities, you know, yeah, uh, and, and yeah. some, uh, you know, uh, things that you, you wouldn't expect uh, for people that grew up, you know, so, so disconnected, even though you're right. uh, biologically related, so... I was, that must have been neat. I was considered the term religious one, <laughs> and my sister wasn't so much at that time. So we kind of we kind of bumped heads a little bit. Mm. Uh, greater than thou, she would call me. I and, can't imagine brothers yeah, and sisters bumping yeah, heads. Yeah, so. it really. But uh, time, time passed on, and and 
and God stepped in. And I have to tell you that Susie is a devout Christian now. Mm. Jimmy is a devout Christian now. God is great in that area. Mm. Uh, so, so when did you start looking for Debbie? Oh, in 96. Okay. We, after we were doing all kinds of searches and somebody said, hey, I think I found this one that's in this town and we drive to that Debbie town. Debbie is a common name. It yes. is, <laughs> except her name was Deborah. Mm. She was, we called her Deborah. Well, I didn't because I didn't remember her, but I was told she was Deborah Lynn. Mm -hmm. And uh, when we uh, would take whatever little view that we thought it could be here, it could be there, they all panned out empty. Yeah. And yeah. so things you just kind of went talk, silent. You went to talk shows? You no, went, we attempted. No well, talk, yeah, you tried no to go to, talk show accepted the you, accepted you, you the You tried bid. to go to Oprah, right. Ellen. More, well, yeah. Ellen wasn't at that time. Not wasn't at that existing, time. no. Yeah. But it was some other, other Sally, Jesse Raphael sure. was one. Uh, sure. And, you know, Susie would go on one angle. So, and Oprah, if you're listening to this, not cool. Yeah. Not cool. Well, and, and, and again, not to say anything bad about Oprah, she may never even got it presented right, to her. Right, right. That's you know, true. It, That's it goes true. through so I'm, much staff. I'm just kidding, Oprah. You're fine. Yeah. But anyway, Oprah did have some time with one of my one of my sons. So, Oprah, if you're hearing this, uh, he's doing great. <laughs> but uh, uh, we didn't know anything more until my brother started telling us he did this DNA test through another uh, group. I don't know who it was. Now, which brother is this? Jimmy. This he Jimmy. wanted to find out, you know, his full ancestry, okay. about who he was and where, he, where the family started off from. And that got my current wife, Victoria, to thinking, well, we need to do that too. But mm -hmm. she's a research addict. Yeah. She says Ancestry.com has got a way, a huge database that they got more to look for. Yeah. So, and hey, it was half off. So we were able to get two <laughs> for the price of one. And so we did it. And during the DNA testing, I got the final results. And when I opened it up, it said high confidence of a sibling. And her name was Debbie. Uh, middle name was probably her adopted name. Well, and when her, was this? A month ago. Yeah. Not even a month ago. Yeah, this just happened. Yes. And so I immediately got goosebumps. I'm telling you, just felt a joy in me since... I think I found my sister and I called my brother and he says, are you 100% on this? Are you sure? I said, I think, I think so. I sent Debbie a message through Ancestry.com mm -hmm. and it took what felt like years. What did you put into that? The you, message? I mean, I, mean I said, I think you're my sister. Mm -hmm. um, we, my sister was removed from the home at a very young age. Uh, but according to this ancestry kit, I think you're my sister. You didn't start with this not a prank? No, I did not. <laughs> I did not because it would be an ancestry. Right. Well, and again, it took, oh, gosh, it felt, like, it felt like every day felt like a month, but it might have been a full month. So that just felt like a lifetime waiting for a response. And then one day I got an email from Ancestry.com and it was her responding. And it was the response. Uh, my name is Rick. But as a child, my name was Ricky. Mm -hmm. And it started off with, hi, Ricky. Oh, wow. I burst into tears. Yeah. I, I'm almost there right now. Yeah. It was just so cool. That's amazing. That that, that came about like that. Yeah. So we, uh, uh, I immediately so responded, I responded to that email yeah. saying, oh, my Lord. <laughs> and I gave my phone number. Please call me. Yeah. And send, and then I called my wife to tell her. So she's at work and in her at her office, and she's crying, and people want to know. And so she's sharing her joyful story of mine because yeah. she feels my stuff as well. Yeah. And uh, so it was really cool. And I, I called Susie, and Susie said it three times. What? Say that again. What? <laughs> and I and I would tell her I found Debbie. Yeah. And. Uh, felt like hours and hours and probably was only 20 minutes to where the phone rang mm -hmm. and her daughter uh, Blair mm -hmm. uh, is helping with the call because uh, 15 years prior Debbie had a stroke okay. and so her brain is a hundred percent but the words from her brain to the mouth come out mixed up and yeah. so she had a very difficult time uh, but we could feel we could feel the happiness we could feel the joy yeah uh, it was it was wonderful and 
Yeah, that's so that's so cool. And it was just in that that moment of reading those first two words that you knew. I knew. I yeah. knew it. Hi, Ricky. Yeah. I knew it right then. Yeah, that is so cool. And so she was overjoyed. Her siblings, I mean, her her siblings, her kids. She's got two sons and two daughters. Yeah. They don't have any aunts and uncles, but yeah. now they have a flood of them. Yeah. And and they have cousins that they never knew about. They were, she was a single child, and and uh, I don't know that her husband at the time had any siblings, but they are so over the top to know that there's a family, a huge family out there yeah. that they now have. Yeah. And and we feel the same way. To me, if anything has ever come to more fruition with me is family, mm. not just adopted family or a biological family, but family in all. Yeah. Um, you don't have to be mine. You're my family, yeah. you know, type thing. Yeah. I raised two daughters that are not mine, yeah. but they're mine. Well, that that's one thing that really stands out to me about your story and why I wanted to have you on the show is uh, just, you know, and there's a lot in your story that we didn't want to go into and didn't go into here, but there's a lot of pain back there and oh, yes. a lot of brokenness. And just the fact that uh, genuine joy and love and, and so, so many beautiful things can come out of that brokenness and that pain. Um, just through just through trying and being open to it despite the pain, I think is so so amazing and so cool. Uh, we're almost out of time here, Rick. Uh, thank you so much for sharing that story with us and with the listeners. Is there anything that you would think um, we kind of hope people might take away from from your story? Never give up. Hmm. Never give up. There's there's a way. God will find a way. Cool. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. Stay tuned. Hey Frankie, I've loved working on this show with you and all, but um, I think it's time I go all in on becoming a full-time gamer. Oh yeah? That's great, but aren't you always talking about getting owned by like 11-year-olds in Warzone and stuff <laughs> no, like that? No, 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 no. That was because my upload speeds, remember? Mm. Whenever I had to drop on someone, I would get destroyed because of the internet l- lag. Right internet lag. Anyway, that all changed when I switched to Direct Link. My upload speeds are way faster now, and my online rank has improved a ton. Bro, I'm gonna be Twitch famous. I'm glad to hear it. And, and you know, just in case if the whole professional gamer thing doesn't work out, it will help you with uploading files for the show. <laughs> Not a chance, my man! And hey, when I become famous and bring in the big bucks from that sweet, sweet Twitch contract, you'll be the first to hear, I told you so. I've got the skills, and now I've got the reliable internet. It's just a matter of time. I'm rooting for you, buddy. Hey, before all that, how about you remind our listeners how they can get the best and fastest upload speeds in Canby? Just go to directlink.coop slash internet, or call them at 503 266 8 one 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 then pick the plan that's right for you every speed not just their top tiers come with unlimited data and upload speeds up to 10 times faster than other providers give them a call and just like my twitch career you won't be disappointed oh my gosh Hey, I'm AJ. I'm your uh, local Oddmos franchise owner. I'm Mike, co-founder of Oddmos. And we're the hosts of The Odd Pod, a podcast that's about life in the pizza industry. We're going to have on some franchisees. We're going to have some different vendors on. We're going to get a snapshot of what goes on behind the scenes in the, the pizza world. Don't forget to tell them about the sports. They're sports. And the crazy wacky pizza that we have every Wednesday that we create. And we also have a special guest every week as well. And I'm Gage, Odd Pod senior sports analyst. Gage, who gave you that title? Me. Oh boy. Find us on Spotify and Apple Music and the Podbean. Can Be Then is brought to you by Retro Revival. They are not your average antique shop. Open daily. Find them on the corner of Northwest 3rd and Grant in downtown Canby or connect with them on Facebook or through email at retrorevivaloc at gmail.com. 
Much of the history of a town can be gleaned from the history of its fires. In these stories, we see a community's courage, values, and, in Canby's case, anyway, his charm. Two terrible fires occurred in the vicinity of Canby in 1916. The first happened at Wilhoit Springs in Molala, named after its discoverer, pioneer John Wilhoit. Forty-five years earlier, John Wilhoit had laid claim to the property and constructed the building that would become the Wilhoit Springs Hotel. Wilhoit Springs is now a county park, but in 1916, it was one of Clackamas County's most well-known and popular tourist destinations. The hotel contained 40 rooms, and there were numerous cottages surrounding it as well. Fortunately, when the fire broke out in February, the hotel was closed, and only one patron was lodging there. The McLaren brothers, who operated the hotel, tried to put out the blaze with chemical fire extinguishers, but their efforts were useless. The hotel burned to the ground, as did two of the cottages. A happy to this story, at least, less than six months later, a new, larger, and improved Wilhoit Springs Hotel was opened on the site of the old one. Built from big logs harvested on the property, the hotel hosted a large crowd from Canby, Oregon City, Salem, and Portland for its grand opening on July 22nd. A turkey dinner was served and the party danced until after midnight, the Oregonian reported. The second terrible 1916 fire happened in April in Hubbard, breaking out in an office building and decimating much of the downtown core. Newspapers reported that the fire spread rapidly and threatened to destroy most of the town. Firefighting apparatus and even dynamite were called for from neighboring Woodburn. In 1923, a fire of unknown origin decimated the Barlow Post Office, which was also the home of W.S. Bud Tull. Fortunately, Bud wasn't home. The fire started in the home's attached woodshed and quickly spread, even burning down several telephone poles that knocked out service for the area temporarily. In May 1942, a two-year-old St. Bernard named Prince heroically saved thousands of Thanksgiving dinners from being barbecued six months early. Prince, the farm dog at a Maxburg turkey factory owned by a Mr. and Mrs. Lamour, was sleeping in his usual perch on the second floor of a hatchery building when he sensed something amiss. His loud barking attracted the nightman, who soon found that an overheated stove in the brooder house had set the building on fire. More than 5,000 young turkeys were inside. The alarm was sounded and local firefighters arrived promptly on the scene. They extinguished the blaze before considerable damage was done, resulting in only a small hole in the roof and the loss of about a dozen birds. Yum! A contingent of Canby firefighters, asked to be on hand to protect the fairgrounds during the annual fireworks show, were late to arrive to the Clackamas County Fair in 1949, but it wasn't their fault. Just blame the overzealous ticket takers at the gate booth who refused to let them in until they paid admission. They paid rather than to have an argument, said a gracious fire chief, Clayton Yoder, who was among the party. Two of them had previously purchased season passes. The rest were charged daily admission, 60 cents. It was a good thing, too. No less than two fires broke out in the dry grass that night, which can be firefighters were able to put out with hand hoses. The Everybody Pays Police, as dubbed by the Canby Herald, also caught the youngsters who'd marched in the Kitty Capers Parade on opening day. The kiddies had been thrilled with the chance to be part of the parade and march with the giant Cliff Thompson, a Hollywood actor who was a reported 8 feet 7 inches tall, and they thought they'd be able to sit in the grandstand and enjoy the rest of the show. But they too were hunted down and charged admission. As a lover and longtime attendee of the Clackamas County Fair, this story doesn't surprise me at all. The 70s were a time of radical growth and change for the country, and this was also true in Canby. It was also a time for a bunch of huge fires. One that stands out, and that some listeners may even remember, was the devastating fire at the Canby Big Store, a local landmark for over 60 years, which was engulfed and completely destroyed in less than an hour in August of 1973. 35 of the district's 38 firefighters fought to control the blaze within a 10,000 square foot concrete building, which had been erected in 1913. The three-story building, which at one time was the largest retail store in Clackamas County, had been a marketplace that housed a number of businesses. The Canby Land Market, Top Flight's Beauty Shop, Canby Hardware and Implement Company, Jean Looks Television Repair Shop. 
Most of them were decimated in the fire, which started at the back wall and spread quickly along the wood floors, ceilings, and staircases. Also destroyed was a Volkswagen owned by Miss Margaret Schoonover. It caught fire when the store's first floor windows exploded and shot flames across the street. The losses in terms of the building, merchandise, and equipment was estimated over $300,000, the equivalent of more than $1.6 million today. Another 1973 fire happened in Woodburn, but it was covered in the Canby Herald and bears mentioning here. The fire broke out in an unassuming building on Front Street that was leased to a company called TLM Publishing Company. The building itself was owned by Eugene Stoller, former publisher of the Woodburn Independent. No one was hurt in the fire, but it caused an estimated fifteen to $20,000 in damage. So, why was this noteworthy? Well, first of all, it was pretty clear an act of arson. Woodburn firefighters said the door into the publishing company had been forced open and the fire showed evidence at two separate points of origin as well as an explosion. Also, TLM Publishing Company published a very specific type of newspaper, pornographic newspapers. Their titles were Ginger and Spice and the Whorehouse Gazette. According to Fire Chief Martin Krupika, it was real hardcore stuff. I'd say it sure sounds like it was pretty hot. Hey, yo. We have many more colorful and thrilling stories to share with you from the history of the Canby Fire District, but this will have to wait until next time on Canby Then. Tyler, did you know that the Australian lyrebird can mimic any sound that it hears? Even chainsaws? No, that's uh, super interesting. Did you know that a baby puffin is called a puffling? Uh, Or that baby sea otters can't swim? So their moms wrap them up in pieces of kelp until they learn how to paddle. Wait, do you know any trivia that isn't like animal related? Not really, but here's some stuff you may not know about the Wild Hair Saloon, where Camby goes to eat and have fun. Okay. The Wild Hair is one of Camby's longest running locally owned restaurants. Owners Joan and Darren Moden have been in business for 16 years. That's cool. Yeah, heck, you were just a baby back then. I, and, wait, what? And they love to give back. They've been members of the Camby Chamber for that long, and they donate over $20,000 to local sports, FFA programs, and civic organizations each year. Wow, I'm legitimately like caught off. That's cool. Yeah. They also support more than 30 jobs in the community through their award-winning staff, some of them as young as 18. Hey, that's older than you are. Uh, dude, I'm te- I'm 10 months younger than you. With, with the days getting longer and the weather getting warmer, the Canby Wild Hair's expansive outdoor patio is the place to be. Furry friends, welcome. Well, that sounds great. I'm going to go check them out just off of Highway 99E next to the Space Age in Canby at 1656 Beaver Creek Road in Oregon City or on their website at thewildhairsaloon.net. Now Hear This Canby is produced by me, Tyler Clausen. Our content director and star reporter is Tyler Frankie. And of course, our show is edited by Cameron Clausen. We also feature the vocal talents of Joy Struby and James Walden. So a round of applause to them. The song that you're hearing right now is Canby by singer-songwriter Olivia Harms, used with her permission. To find more work from her, you can visit her website, olivia13.com. Now Hear This Can Be is dedicated to preserving independent local journalism and redefining local news with our fun, fresh, and energetic brand of storytelling. Our sincere thanks to our local sponsors who make this show possible. Please show your appreciation by supporting the small businesses who support us. The production of Now Hear This Studios, Canby's locally owned full-service audio, video, and media production company. Our mission is to produce the best content in the universe. And we'd love to help you do it. Find us online at nhtstudios.com. Um, I will take a motion to adjourn. I just moved it. I didn't even ask for it, though. (laughs)